Hey guys, it's time to finally review Alpha and Omega Family Vacation, the movie I've gotten the most requests to do ever. Unfortunately, there are still some people belonging to the Alpha and Omega fanbase who feel that I'm reviewing these movies simply to piss them off. Clearly, I haven't done as good a job in expressing myself as I could have done, but I think I figured out a better way to get my message across. There we go. Now that I'm Wolfabob, I can more easily speak the language of the fans of this franchise. And now, Alpha and Omega, Family Vacation. Just like Alpha and Omega 4, I find myself baffled by the movie's title. Family Vacation? I thought that surviving in the wild was a constant struggle for any animal. Since when do wolves have leisure time that allow them to take vacations? Our movie opens with Kate Humph and their pups walking to their first family vacation in Alfred Creek Falls. I do have to give the movie some credit. For a long time, I heard rumors that they were going to visit Humphrey's parents in Sawtooth, Idaho, which would have been one of the dumbest things they could have done, since it would have made the first movie completely pointless. So, making them go to a completely different place for their vacation was pretty smart. What isn't smart was making them go to a vacation spot that's over 300 miles away from Jasper. And they're getting there on foot. They're going to need a vacation from this vacation! Humphrey tries to entertain the kids by doing some animal impressions, but they aren't amused. Doing a porpoise impression? Weird! How does he even know what a porpoise is? And since when did he do animal impressions? The pups are disappointed because they weren't allowed to bring their friends along for this trip. Since when do kids bring their friends along on family vacations? This is a family vacation, and our first one together. We get closer when we have these shared experiences. One minute into the movie, and we already see the kids disrespecting their mom. Nice. And what do we always say about a strong family? Huh? Huh? A strong family can survive almost anything. When did you ever say that? Runt knocks on Claudette for wanting to be with Fleet, then we get a flashback to Alpha and Omega 3 because the movie thinks that you're too stupid to remember who Fleet is. Claudette was making that face while kissing and moaning as she was thinking of Fleet on his back, spread eagle, and smiling seductively. Only two minutes in and I gotta bust this out! Must be a Bob show! Claudette chases Runt up a tree, and Stinky offers this bit of insight. May I suggest some parenting tips? When I become the leader, I will create a wolf park, so the younger ones can be supervised. One, shut up. Two, saying you're gonna build a park isn't a parenting tip. Three, you don't need a park to supervise your kids. Four, as someone who is currently talking back to his parents, what kind of a position are you in to offer parenting tips? All you're doing is being a hypocritical jackass. What about you? Constantly hugging Frida and Fran, the porcupines? Yeah, that's really normal. Wait, that's why I'm always pulling needles out of you? You're constantly pulling needles out of your child, and you never once asked him why? You're a terrible mother! And why is she bringing up the porcupines when they're talking about her and Fleet? Is she implying that Runt is involved with the porcupines? Stinky then makes the suggestion that if he had been able to bring along his best friend Brent for the trip, he could help supervise. I'm sorry, but since when were these two friends? I can't even remember Stinky ever talking to Brent. And I really don't think you want this guy supervising your kids. Brent and I have big plans when we leave the forest one day. We're gonna merge the wolf pack with the bear clan. And I'm looking forward to the day when that finally happens. Oh, wait. No, I'm not, because you're never gonna grow up! Brilliant idea, by the way. Mixing bears with wolves, 
I can't see that backfiring in any way. Humphrey finally dispels the situation after he brings up how much these pups love each other if they're going to put themselves into danger for each other like we've seen in previous movies. Which mostly came out of the pups outright defying their parents' authority, implying that not listening to their parents is okay. Way to go, Dad. By the way, we're going to see a lot of flashbacks in this movie. Over six minutes of screen time is repurposed footage from the last four movies. That may not seem like a lot, but in a movie that's only 39 minutes long, it's really noticeable. It's also worth noting that this was supposed to be the final chapter of the Alpha and Omega franchise. Only 33 minutes of it is original material. Think about that. Stinky smells some approaching wolves whom we've never met before, using canned sniffing sound effects, no less. And they have some terrible news. They're trapping wolves! Trapping wolves? They're relocating us! When the caribou population dwindles... Relocating? Are we seriously back to that? One, who are these wolves? Are they a part of Kate Hump's pack? I really hope they aren't Daria's sisters, because that just makes me question where the hell are we? Two, humans are relocating wolves because of the dwindling caribou? Why would they do that? Wouldn't the wolves leave on their own accord to find more food? If not, wouldn't they just die out like nature intended? Wouldn't relocating the wolves to different locations only upset the balance of whatever environment they're put in? Who is this helping? 3. Humphrey says, Are we seriously going back to that? It's bad enough when the first plot point is exactly the same as it was in the first movie, but Humphrey is aware of it and is already weary of this movie rehashing familiar territory? It's like he's Deadpool, but phenomenally less entertaining! Oh, they're taking away all the forest! And when the forest goes, so go the caribou! Except for the fact that they're in a NATIONAL PARK WHERE THEY CAN'T TAKE AWAY THE FOREST! Are they capturing wolves everywhere? No, not past the border. Or the mountains. Most of the wolves are hiding in the mountains. How long is this gonna go on? It usually lasts five moons or so. And we're back to plugging in random words from previous movies without understanding what the context is. It's never established what five moons means, but just like in the third movie, it still sounds to me like they're saying five months. Are you seriously saying that the wolves are regularly hunted for five months at a time and Kate wouldn't already know about this? They make a break for the mountains. Aren't they already in the mountains? And the camera cuts back to Kate Hump before we see the other wolves get shot with tranquilizer darts. What, was actually showing them getting shot too scary? God forbid we establish a sense of peril in this movie. By the way, we're only six minutes into this movie, and we're already having the family vacation put on hold so we can deal with the conflict of the wolves being captured. With a title like Family Vacation, shouldn't this be a road trip movie? Or a showcase of wacky shenanigans that the wolves are getting into while enjoying a new and exotic location? What was the point of calling this movie Family Vacation when it's not about the family vacation? The wolves decide to hop a train to get to the border, when simply going into the mountains would be a lot easier since, you know, they're already there! But they need to cross this little valley here before getting tranked like the other wolves did. So how do they get across? We can get across the field with that. Kate, can you see the train tracks? Um, I think... Yes, we gotta turn. Okay, Runt, start to turn. Right, right. <clears throat> Your other right. Okay, stop. Now everyone forward. Hey, Runt, how does it feel to be the caboose? <laughs> Ow! Mom, Runt bit my tail. Could you two exhibit some maturity in this very dramatic situation? <clears throat> How's that for maturity, Stinky? Everyone quiet. This scene. This... STUPID SCENE! This is the entire Alpha and Omega series wrapped up in a nutshell! No, seriously, virtually every problem in the franchise can be seen in just these few seconds. First of all, why was it Humphrey who came up with this idea? 
Shouldn't it have been the brilliant strategic alpha mind of Kate that thought of a way out? This is the movie yet again diminishing Kate's character. Second, we should be able to see their legs through the grass, but we don't. The log is just hovering. That's lazy. Third, the adults are in the front and the kids are in the back? You know what would happen if you put the adults in the front and the pups in the back? NOTHING! The pups can't lift their end! They're not moving! Not thinking about the obvious solution of putting one adult in the front and one in the back with the kids in the middle is STUPID! And preferably, Kate should be the one in the front since she's supposed to be the leader. Fourth, Runt being the caboose and being able to bite Claudette's tail implies that they're all walking in single file. Why are they walking in single file and why is Runt at the very end? Not only is he left vulnerable to the trappers or any other predators, but it's been pretty well established by now that Runt will just go off and do his own thing regardless of what kind of danger doing so would put him in. Why isn't he in the middle of the log where his parents can make sure that he stays in their sights? This shows how embarrassingly irresponsible Kate and Humphrey are as parents. Fifth, it would be perfectly fine if the pups were just keeping their end of the log up while Kate humped the steering, but no. Kate tells the pups to steer with her when nothing that has happened so far would suggest that they'd be coordinated enough and willing and able to work together as a unit in order to do so. And by the way, Kate told the pups to go right. They did go right! Six, do you really expect us to believe that these trappers didn't see this log moving around right in front of them? Our heroes only survive because the villains are incompetent idiots! Seventh, why isn't it Lily who gets the idea to hide under the log? Remember how she loves doing turtles? This scene demands that it be Lily and her turtle shtick that saves the day! Eighth, I have to actually explain this! We then meet the trappers who are chasing them, and not only are they recycled characters that we've already seen before, but they also sound like dumb rednecks from Alabama. Look, whoop up! Big whoop up! The three nine whoop up! And two adults! Brother, we hit the jackpot! You may also notice that these guys aren't wearing uniforms, like the park rangers we saw in the first movie. Please correct me if I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm pretty damn sure it doesn't become a free-for-all every time there's some kind of ecological crisis. There's a slight dip in the squirrel population, so get your guns and chug some moose heads, cause it's open season on everything! Hooey! Wolf, give it all you've got! Hooray, more running speeds that don't match their gates like in movie 3. And the pups can actually keep up with their parents. Look, first of all, wolves cannot run this fast. They just can't. Secondly, since these pups are obviously inspired by corgis, not actual wolf pups, shouldn't they be running more like this? Let's do our thing! You mean our being chased by big mean bears thing? Oh, and now they're kicking up dust clouds, which should slow them down a little bit, since they now need to concentrate on digging into the ground a little as they run, and they're still able to keep up with their parents. Where'd you learn to do that? From being chased by bears. Nearly bitten off more than we could hunt numerous times. You had no idea that your children are being repeatedly chased by bears? WORST PARENTS EVER! While that's going on, we find... Uh, Brent, Agnes, and Fleet from the third movie looking for the other wolves. Why? Claudette is headed to the falls. I gotta make sure she's safe and doesn't get captured. She's my girl. Young love. Well, a young something. I prefer to imagine you two young children humping like wild beasts. Must be a Bob show! Oh, Marcel and Patty, the only two birds that don't bother me. Oh yeah, Brent is terrified of birds again. So not only did him getting over his fear of birds in movie 3 end up being absolutely pointless, but now he's going back to fearing birds, so that was even more pointless on a bigger scale! There is a premium for wolf pups. We know! That is where we come in. We're all helping. We got it all worked out. When they try and capture Fleet, I do this! Ah! And I do this. Ah! And then they do this! My money's on the trappers! You see, the humans aren't allowed to capture the other animals. Okay, fine. What's stopping them from tranquilizing you, pulling your unconscious asses aside, and then taking the pups? 
Oh, I get it. Yes, your heart aches for your friends. But it's not practical to put yourself in danger while doing it. Claudette is gonna be with me for the rest of my life, and nothing is gonna stop me from finding her. Unless, of course, she's too busy with the next sequel and she conveniently forgets you exist. Oh, for God's sake. And then they just happen to bump into the porcupines from Shadow Forest! I'm sorry, but who was demanding that these characters come back? When I asked for these movies to pay closer attention to continuity, this isn't what I was talking about! I'm Fran, and this is my sister Frida. We are here to help Runt. Like, he is a wolf in need, and he is our king of Shadow Forest. Yes, Frida is your sister, and for some reason she has a completely different accent than yours. Who's the pretty boy? Shouldn't he be in hiding? Didn't someone tell them the goth look is out? <gasps> okay, ladies, cool the quills. I'm Brink. That is Agnes. Since you all look alike, can't you all be friends? Casual racism. You know, for kids! We jump back to the wolves who just barely missed the train, so they're stuck waiting until the night train comes by. What do they do until then? Oh, you're gonna love this. Runt shows them how to climb trees just like he can. And they learned it so quickly and easily that they didn't even try to exploit the comedic opportunities that would come from their first couple of tries where they should have failed. But nope! They just immediately picked it up, even though none of them have ever tried to do it before now. And because all the other wolves know how to climb trees, Runt has forfeited the one thing that made him special, and has rendered himself completely useless. Nice job, movie! Humphrey takes the opportunity to tell his kids about the last time he was stuck in a tree, which leads us into another flashback. Humphrey! Oh, my butt! My butt! That really hurt. Wow, Dad. Sounds like you crushed it. Yeah! Now tell him about the part where you almost started a war after that little stunt. Kate tries to get the pups to the next train while Humphrey distracts the trappers. Frankly, if I ever saw a wolf doing this, I think I just might crap my pants. Then the other critters show up, which I guess makes the trappers forget how to use their guns, giving them a chance to escape. And they continue to run for several more hours into the night. Weren't they just at the train tracks earlier? How did they get this far away? It's Noah's Ark! More like Noah's train! How do you know Bible stories? They effortlessly make it onto the train, including Brent, who's weighed down by three porcupines, and then- OH MY GOD! Ow, ow, ow. Interspecies orgies in a kid's movie? This is Noah's Ark! Must be a bomb show! Oh, and look at that! Now they're just tossing in footage from the first movie without it being a flashback. Thanks for going that extra mile, movie. Humphrey and I fell in love right here. I finally got Kate to howl with me. Humphrey, you had me at hello. Kate, let's make this moment last. I have to pee. I have to pee. You bastards! You vicious, talentless bastards! You could have worked to make this scene like the original, and you come in with your petty, feeble, peeing joke, and you grind it into the dirt! The beautiful, emotional scene whose frames you are not worthy to kiss! Oh, it makes me mad. But hey, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe this is funnier than I give it credit for. Why don't we try sticking it into some other big emotional scenes? I think I'll miss you most of all. I have to pee. Set your feelings, you know it to be true. I have to pee. Jack. Jack! Jack! There's a poop, Jack. I have to pee. But wait! It gets better! Not only is that Moonlight Howl scene forever tainted with that I have to pee, but we then get to sing the pee-pee song to help Brent do his business. There was a little stream who fed into a river and a 
river flowed and flowed into a giant lake. But wait! It gets better! This also prompts another flashback to when Humphrey had his own awkward tinkle time in the first movie. Because... This is necessary to the plot, right? Come on, let's help him. One more time. There was a little stream who fed into a river. Have I mentioned that this movie's stupid? Because this movie's really fing stupid! After Branch finally does what bears do in the woods, the train makes a random stop to let them get off. And of course, the trappers are still right behind them. Aren't there other wolves they could be hunting? I think that Daria might be an easier target. They keep on walking into the next day, when Stinky picks up the scent of a moose, making Humphrey have ANOTHER flashback to when he first arrived in Sawtooth. Yeah. It was horrible. He had this wide stance. I had to go into counseling. NO YOU DIDN'T! THAT NEVER HAPPENED! In the original movie this is flashing back to, Humphrey just gets his legs caught in the moose's antlers. It's bad enough that this movie has to rely on flashbacks to fill up time, but now they're making up events that didn't even happen? Just so Humphrey can get crapped on? I think these writers have already done a sufficient enough job with that! Kiss my furry ass, movie! You know who is gonna need counseling when all this is over with? ME! SOMEBODY GET CAESAR Milan ON THE PHONE! Okay, wolves, there is a human road to the right. You need to run to that. Human road? Yes, they can't shoot where there are humans. These aren't officials working for the park. They're dumb rednecks with guns. Do they really look like the kind of guys who will do things by the book? Oh, and look at that. Brent magically turned yellow. Another fine example of the animators dicking with us. They get to the road, and this somehow makes the trappers powerless to shoot them. If human safety is an issue, fine, I get it, but why can't they do anything now when there's no one around? They need to find a faster way to get to the border, which makes Humphrey think of how much ground they covered when they were in that librarian's camper in the first movie. Yeah, you didn't know Papa was a rolling stone, did you? You, you don't get that reference, do you? Okay. HOW DID YOU GET THAT REFERENCE?! Patty and Marcel then proceed to lead the wolves to that very same camper, because they know that the librarian is here and is about to make her way back to Idaho. How do they know this? How do we have a way of marking vehicles? Specifically, windshields. Now humans think it's random, but... Well, it's not. THAT DOESN'T MAKE ANY SENSE! ONE! WHY ARE YOU MARKING CARS IN THE FIRST PLACE?! WHAT DO YOU HAVE TO GAIN FROM KNOWING WHERE THE HUMANS ARE GOING?! TWO! HOW DO YOU RECOGNIZE THE SPLATTER OF YOUR CRAP AS YOU MARK THE CARS?! THREE! YOU SPECIFICALLY MARK WINDSHIELDS?! THAT'S THE FIRST THING THAT THE HUMANS ARE GONNA WASH! FOUR! MORE TOILET HUMOR?! WAY TO KEEP IT CLASSY, MOVIE! The little librarian comes out before they can sneak aboard her camper, and how does she react to them? She feeds them, of course! I give you the world's first wolf -a boo And yes, I know that wolves aren't the bloodthirsty monsters that they've been portrayed as throughout history, but we need to keep human-wolf interaction to a minimum. Is this what you want to teach the kids watching at home? That if ever they meet a wolf, the best thing to do is to give it food? The trappers show up, and again, they somehow miss the wolves as they go into hiding. You know, instead of trying to turn this old lady into a new character, they just flat out say that she's the librarian from the first movie. With this in mind, why isn't this guy the biker that she was with? For that matter, why did they even use this character model in the first place? I get that they're working with a lower budget, and if making up new characters is too expensive... I guess I can begrudgingly accept that, but if you have to recycle old characters, why not go back to using the park rangers from the first movie? They're dressed for official business, giving the impression that they're just doing their jobs, which was something I legitimately admired. It'd be too easy to make the humans just plain evil, but they were only doing what they thought was the right thing. It was a very realistic and very mature way of presenting these characters. Also, I'm pretty sure that they were designed without the typical facial controls that you would see in other, more prominent characters, since they weren't going to get a lot of screen time. Had these characters been used in this movie, 
their lack of facial features would force them to be shot in such a way so that you don't see their faces, and their dialogue would be severely limited. This would make them mysterious, unidentifiable, unrelatable, and menacing. They lose their humanity, and we're afraid of them. Very much like the character simply known as Keys from E.T. We don't know why he's hunting E.T., but the way he's presented makes him unknown and intimidating. But no, a couple of comic relief rednecks works just as well, I guess. Oh, and these Canadian rednecks are driving a truck that belongs to Sawtooth Park Fish and Game. Damn it all, you know how to change the fur patterns in order to make brand new characters! How hard can it be to change a decal?! The librarian leads them off the wolf's trail, and Humphrey somehow knows how to tell her in pantomime that he wants her to drive them across the border. Which she then does! Lady, shouldn't you be calling animal control right about now? The trappers somehow know where she was going so that they could lie and wait for her, and they somehow know she'd have the wolves in tow. One poorly animated chase scene later, in which the librarian and some other people are put into danger, they're really mindful of human safety, aren't they? They drive off-road and then make a break for the border on foot. I gotta do something. Get our pups out of here. No. She's the alpha. You're the stay-at-home dad. You get the pups out of here so that she can do something! No, we can't do that. Kate had her children, she's fulfilled her purpose in life, so she has nothing of value to contribute anymore. Dear God, I hate these movies. Humphrey goes back to confront the trappers, and... <laughs> it's interesting. Some Alpha and Omega fans got a chance to see the movie air on Discovery Kids on Mexican television back in March, and some of them were disappointed with how they didn't get to see more than what we see here. All I have to say in response to that is... Seriously? What were you expecting? The most violent these movies ever got was showing the occasional scruff being not on. Did you honestly expect them to show Humphrey murdering a human being? Really? The rest of the wolves wait patiently for Humphrey to cross the border with them, but it doesn't look good. Uh, is that okay? Is he? He's the best dad in the world. No, he isn't. He named you Stinky and your brother Runt, ensuring that you will never know the touch of a woman. He hasn't taught you anything about how to function as adults, he's neglectful, irresponsible, and he has no idea what you kids do in your spare time. If not for the fact that he doesn't physically beat you, I would call him the worst father in the history of fiction. Kate finally remembers that she's supposed to be the tough one, so she goes back to help Humphrey. What if they're taken? Oh, please, please, let them make it past one more, one more disaster. Don't let this be the last drama for the drama wolves. Yes, with three more sequels already in the works, I'm sure that this is where they're going to get killed off. Oh my god, they survived. It's a miracle. And no, I didn't cut anything out here. This movie honestly couldn't figure out how Kate and Humphrey were supposed to defeat the Trappers without getting shot, so it all happened completely off-screen. We're only left with the implications that they both murdered the Trappers, but we can't actually show that without further feeding into the bad wolf stereotypes. It's alright, kids! Our heroes are killers, but we didn't actually see them do it, so it's okay! Well, wasn't exactly the route we wanted. But here we are, Alfred Creek Falls. So they left Canada because it was swarming with trappers, just so they could get back to Canada with no repercussions whatsoever?! Come on! So, how was our first family vacation, guys? You want my honest opinion? AWFUL! I can't believe it. These filmmakers are determined to make each of these movies worse than the last. The animation's a joke, the puffs are even more obnoxious, their parents are idiots, the inclusion of their little friends only made the movie more painful than it already was, the flashbacks were tedious and pointless, the wolves making human references didn't make any sense, the premise of them being on vacation was completely meaningless, the trappers being stereotypical rednecks is a step back even for these movies, and with only 33 minutes of original material to boast, this entire movie is f***ing lazy. And again, no Lillian Garth! That is unforgivable! The only good thing I can say about this movie? I don't have to deal with this piece of crap anymore.
There was a little stream who fed into a river, and the river flowed and flowed into a giant lake. Oh!